Welcome, Thanks. everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Zip Crummel from Columbia Gorge Community College, uh, where our, I'm an instructor for psychology, and I'm the chair for the social science department. And uh, because I've been involved with QM for a number of years now, uh, I got, I was, what brought me into this presentation and the history of what we've done at our college. Beth, introduce yourself, please. Uh, and I'm Beth Hale, and I've worked at Chemeketa Community College for the past 14 years, and I've um, been involved. I actually got involved with Quality Matters the very first day I was at Chemeketa um, when we launched our pilot a course review program, and that was back in early 2007. Um, and so I have some experience with the custom review tool as well, and so that is how I became involved in this presentation. Next slide. Okay, so um, what we want to talk to you a little bit about today is why you might use the MyCR tool within Quality Matters um, system and what led us there and, and our experience, a little bit about that. So um, this workshop or this webinar will do a couple of things. We are going to share our own experiences and, and again the needs and direction that we went. Um, but also we're going to show you a little bit about the MyCR tool and system and show you the capabilities. Um, so just to start out, uh, just to make sure everyone's aware, and, and you may well be, but within Quality Matters, the MyQM system, there are two ways to manage course reviews. And one is the CRMS system, and that is the one that uh, most of us are familiar with. Uh, and then they also have a, a newer version called the MyCR tool, which stands for My Custom Reviews. And that system allows you to really get in there and customize things and make it your own. So that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. And again, just for a little bit more background and for comparison purposes, um, as a refresher or, or so you know, the, the CRMS is used to manage and conduct official Quality Matters reviews. And it will also help you manage informal reviews. And also it can be used as a self-review tool. Um, but it does use the current QM rubric. And it also uses a number of other um, standardized quality matters processes and communications. So it's not completely customizable. But the MyCR tool is very customizable. And so we're going to talk a little bit about, well, why did we even think about moving to the MyCR CR tool? And I meant to look this up when they introduced this, but I believe it was about three to four years ago. And someone in the chat may have an answer for that. Um, but the reason that Chemeketa started thinking about it is that we did want to customize our reviews. We had been doing official and informal quality matter reviews, um, like I said, since 2007. And so by about 2014, we'd had enough experience and feedback from faculty um, where we really wanted to customize both the process and the rubric and the standards. And so when Quality Matters introduced the MyCR tool, we were like, wow, what is this all about? What can we do with it? Tell us more. And Zip, I'll let you share um, why, why Columbia Gorge thought about it. We've been doing the formal QM review of our courses, or those select courses. But we really wanted to make sure that the bar was set. And we've had, we've had some ch administrative change. We have a new president. We've got um, a new dean, a new vice president all in terms of instruction. And we wanted to have some, a consistent bar that all of our online and hybrid courses at least met. But we were getting um, kickback, feedback, whether it was the old timers saying, well, why do I have to do this now? I've always done it this way and it works. To new people saying, I don't understand what it means. The formal QM review is very higher academia language. And we found out that we have a number of very good adjunct instructors who don't speak higher academia. So the team of master reviewers at my school decided, came met together with at that time Paula Asher and we started talking about what can we do to still maintain a bar but help, the, help these people get, to, get there without being so intimidated. And that's where my CR came in.
how did we get, well, this is our committee that she shows here. And Paula was our virtual campus coordinator. And so we met and talked about it. We had several meetings talking about the issues and what we were hearing from other faculty. And I think as, well, I know as a group, we didn't want to lose some level of quality, but we understood because we know how long it takes to do a formal QM review. So even from the reviewer perspective, that's a lot of time spent. If we were going to do that for every class, we didn't want to do it and they didn't want to do it. They didn't understand it. It looked like too much work for many of them. Um, you know, so we needed something else. So when Paula brought up my, you know, my CR, it seemed like an answer because as um, Beth has said, we can customize it and it took some steps. We're still probably not done with the customization, but it, and it took some steps, but it's becoming more and more accepted because we can make it usable and still hold the standard. We started with a faculty poll and these were some of the things we asked, um, you know, involvement to QM, found the benefits of, drawbacks of, and those who had, I don't think, I don't think hardly anybody who had done QM couldn't come up with a benefit, but the list of drawbacks, again, because of the formality, the language involved, and the huge amount of time spent, those were consistently brought up as the drawbacks for all of the classes. You know, and as I said, like, I think probably like best school too, we have a number of adjuncts who want to do well, but they may teach one class a term. This was a lot of work to add on to that, to make it to, for the kind of standard, plus then us or Paula as reviewers. So these were some of the questions we asked in our poll. The big question that came up was this, would you like to see the college adopt a tailored version of QM for your reviews? The maybes, we would, <laughs> I know it doesn't look very good. He said, well, yeses, but when we took the yeses and the maybes, at least it showed they were open to consideration. So we ran with that, okay? Because so, only 10%, 10 percent, 10 and a half percent said no. So we ran with the larger group and put them together and said, let's see what we can do. Well, there were other questions of it and with interesting answers, this was the one that really told us, okay, let's see what we can do. So for Chemeketa's part, um, the way we really um, practically got started down the path of making it happen um, was that there was growing interest around facilitation standards and um, RSI or regular and substantive interaction. And the real impetus came from our faculty senate and the faculty senate took it up as a discussion topic and they formed a work group um, which researched um, best practices and online facilitation and delivery and then developed a set of voluntary standards including annotations which I was thrilled about um, and then they adopted those as voluntary guidelines for our online faculty and so our department then took that and ran with it and we called together a steering committee to look at the possibility of incorporating that into the quality matters rubric so that we cover both course design and facilitation and um, that really told us that we were going to need a customizable rubric tool and um, the steering committee met for a year to really relook at we did some polls and some um, sessions with folks faculty that had been part of the review process and really looked at the needs um, for what a revised informal review process might look like and then also the scope um, and we, we wanted to really of course we wanted to make sure that we had buy-in to increase the rubric of standards to include facilitation and we did get that we got it from leadership we got it from faculty and so we moved forward then the next year with the task force and that task force really made a lot of the decisions um, the the you know day-to-day -day details and logistics um, they dug in with us and looked at the specific standards and the language and we, we were reworked that um, we added those facilitation standards um, we changed some to be optional versus mandatory. Um, our for some reason, our faculty felt very strongly that module level objectives should not be a mandatory requirement, which 
I believe that's standard QM standard 2.2. Um, so anyway, it's now an optional standard, but of course, as we all know, you know, you need module level objectives to really have a solid course. But so that was one little change. So um, the task force did that work for a year and then we started piloting it and we did go to the MyCR system. So um, just to look a little deeper at what the MyCR system will do um, and what it looks like. So it's very similar to the CRMS in that um, the, the QMC, boy, we have a lot of acronyms going on here, but the person who's coordinating the reviews, the QMC, um, has access to a menu. And you can see that on the left there. Um, and you have access to a full range of tools and functionality. So it will manage your reviews for you. Um, you can get in, it will tell the faculty who are going to have a review done what the steps are. It walks them through that. Um, you can see on the opening screen here, they can start a course review application just like they would in the QM CRMS, a lot of acronyms. Um, and it's, it's very, very similar to the CRMS if you've used that. But the beauty of it is that you can customize a lot of these elements. So you can customize the application. You can customize the worksheet. You can customize the rubric. Um, you can customize the standards. That's the same as the rubric. Well, you can customize the rubric, not, in ter not only in terms of the standards, but also the points. Um, what's optional versus what's mandatory. And then also you can customize the communication. So the automatic emails that the system sends out to the various review team roles, you can customize that language. I'm just gonna pause for a second and make sure we have no questions in the chat. We're good for now. Perfect. Beth, can I throw one thing in? Please. Um, this does not preclude or, or prevent in any way that an instructor and his, and his or her course go through the formal QM review. That's still an opt-in, at least at, at Columbia Gorge. So if I wanted to have the logo on my course and I wanted the little insignia in the catalog that shows, hey, if you take this course, it's met QM certification, that was still a very viable option. But we wanted to make sure we had something like she's like Beth is talking about in terms of my CR that everybody could use, so at least we had a base standard. I think I'll also point out while we're on this screen, um, if you are part of a consortium, a statewide consortium, um, you also have the option to share resources with each other. And you'll notice at the top of this screen, um, it asks you to select what institution this workshop. This worksheet belongs to and so of course I would have selected Chemeketa but Paula and some of my other colleagues had often talked about how we could be sharing these resources we could share each other's rubrics we could share the worksheet um, so I mean it really lends itself well to collaboration And again, this is just another example of, of how you can customize things. So this is the um, list of automatic emails that is generated that goes out to the various review team roles. And for those of us that have participated in QM, you know that you'll get an email that says, please do this, or now the review has moved on to this, your next steps are yada, yada, yada. And uh, this allows you to go in and individually edit those so you can customize it for your process, for your faculty. It's really, really wonderful. And again, you can see um, I could use Columbia Gorge's emails. They could use mine or we can use our own. And again, Here's more, more of the system. Um, just to share with you that it has all the functionality that the CMS has. Uh, reviews, you can run reports. Oh, 
All right, and Zip, over to you. I'm going to turn off my video. <laughs> okay, what did we change? When we started with a course worksheet, that's the course worksheet is what the instructor of that course completes. And there were a lot of, it was quite extensive, a lot of questions. Uh, so play times they needed links, we wanted objectives. This is in the more formal version. Uh, objectives, both course objectives, uh, learning or module objectives, and you know, there's quite a lot there. We really wanted to simplify that because that's the first thing any instructor would have to do for the course was do the worksheet. So we started there. Um, and you know, it took a couple iterations back and forth, posting people making the, you know, from the team making comments and corrections. So the language was there, more succinct, more easily re readable um, and understandable. Um, and so connection to learning objectives, activities changed to optional. I don't want to read this whole thing to you, but you can see we did a number of things what we needed, what an instructor would need to do if they just wanted the course to pass the initial standard so he, could, so he or she could use it in our LMS, which our LMS is Moodle. Okay, so that would have been an online course. That could have been a hybrid course or even a face-to-face -face course that wanted to use a Moodle module to go alongside that course. Okay, we looked at the optional standards. Um, we changed points to show what was more important than not, because one of the things we really wanted to maintain was RSI. That would be um, regular and substantive interaction with students within the LMS, because that would be appropriate for both hybrid and online. And so we really emphasized that, even from the, from the get-go. That was one of the things we wanted to emphasize. Show us in your Moodle show how you are going to have ongoing communication with your students. They can get a hold, they can ask you questions, you can ask them questions, there could be responses. To us that was really important. So that was kind of the, I would say the major thread that went through all of our, especially our initial editing and changing of standards. Beth? Okay, um, it I hope nobody minds, but my internet's uh, very unstable today, so I might keep my video off for a while. Um, but in terms of what you're making a change, so kind of along the same lines, um, we did also simplify the course worksheet and made it a little bit more relevant to what you needed. Um, we included RSI standards in the rubric. Um, we also modified the review process a little bit. Uh, based on the pilot results, our faculty who were having courses reviewed told us that they would feel more comfortable with only the tech hub, which is my department, the instructional designer team, if we were the ones looking at their live course and their facilitation examples. So we kind of split, we modularized that process a little bit and um, peer faculty review the course design standards, just like in a normal Quality Matters uh, review. And the Tech Hub faculty review the RSI or the facilitation standards. So that's a little unique. Uh, and the other huge change for our college is that we, it was adopted by our college as policy that every online instructor would have at least one course reviewed with this new set of standards. These, this rubric and go through this process. And the thinking was behind the one is that um, once faculty had learned about and experienced the standards with one course, that would, that would be enough to get them to make those changes in other courses. So that's what we changed and how we took it. Um, I wanted to show you just a little bit more about how easy it is to modify the specific rubric, because I think that's why a lot of institutions go to the MyCR tool is the ability to actually get in there and modify that language and the scoring. Um, so as you can see here, here's a screenshot of it will it will list out. Um, first of all, you have the option to, to choose which rubric you want to start with. So you can certainly start with the standard QM rubric of standards and then modify that and it will list all standards for you. Um, and then for each individual standard, 
you can edit the language, you can edit the number, the numbering system. So if you want to completely renumber it, you can. Um, you can edit the annotation, the points, whether it's required. Uh, so it really allows you a lot of customization. And then um, once you've created a custom rubric, you give it a name and it will store your rubrics for you. Um, so I've heard of some institutions where individual programs have chosen to create a rubric that works for their program or their discipline. And they uh, develop a rubric. Uh, and I've heard of some institutions which have a starting rubric, a base level, which all programs, all departments must meet and then uh, individual departments kind of take it from there and evolve it further and customize it. And the system will let you do that and it will store your rubrics for you and you can come back to them. Um, as you're assigning reviews and review teams, you choose which rubric they will use. So it's really a very flexible and wonderful system for individualizing your review approach. All right, Zip, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to talk about some of the advantages. Um, because we worked, we took the uh, faculty input, we really did try to listen and on our initial changes, and we went back to them and say, okay, look at this now. What do you think of this? There were more suggestions, more complaints, more comments, but we took what was viable and uh, positive, constructive, and went back and made more changes the language, the points, and then we said, okay, now let's use it, okay? And overall, yes, it's another piece of work. We're holding them to a standard, but I think the response was what was greatly improved and much more positive by using a custom within my CR, because it was, we could say, this is the CGCC. Um, this is the bar we want you to beat. Okay, and it was a little more, it was a lot more, actually, not a little, it was a lot more palatable for, I think, most of the faculty, you know, and to be honest, some still didn't meet it, and in that case, they weren't allowed to teach online, that we had, to, we worked out, we had to work up other options, but I think as more and more people fell into it, and we continued making small changes to the process, I think more and more people bought into it and made good use of it. So, you know, I, I, I would think if I took all of our online and hybrid courses on, on our LMS right now, I would be much happier and I would see a much improved product compared to be when we be, before we started this. Because before this, we just had those who had done formal QM reviews to meet standards. The others were kind of hodgepodge. I mean, our distance learning coordinator really tried to hold them to it but at the same time, I think she was up against numbers and there's always politics involved and things like this. So this gave us something to work off of and a standard that finally our instructional committee, uh, representative of all of our departments said, yes, let's run with this. And we couldn't have done that with the full, full formal QM review, but, make, but fine tuning the MyCR made it a very workable issue for my faculty. Yeah, and I'll say from Chemeketa's perspective, I would agree with that. Um, the ability to customize that language and really make it our own um, made our faculty happy. That, that was a satisfying process, I think, for everybody who had been involved in the Quality Matters review views for all those years. Because, uh, of course, for years I'd been hearing just little feedback here and there. And so they being able to get involved with us and have that process of looking at the rubric and modifying those standards, I mean, that really gave them ownership over that language and the standards. And so I agree with that. Um, that was a big pro of moving to the MyCR for us. Um, the other thing, quite frankly, from a, a QMC standpoint, I coordinate the reviews at Chemeketa. I liked the ability of, of being able to modify some of the language around the communication and make it my own, make it a little bit more clear. Also, um, 
we were running quite a few reviews every year and we had delegated quite a bit of that work out. I had people in my office helping me. And so see, I was able to modify that email language to say, contact so-and-so for this. If you need help with this, please follow up with this person. Um, so it was very useful from a st the standpoint of managing the reviews. I would, I'm going to add on to it. I, I totally agree with Beth, how it came to management. And as I said, in particular, we focused on the RSI. And I think they quickly fell into place what we wanted there. And we were trying to be uh, versatile in terms of our interpretation. But uh, our team would look at 30 to 40 uh, a year at least uh, to look at. And if we saw it was there, the RSI and the course looked good, they were going to be looked at again for at least a couple years. And our emails told them that. If there was an issue, we offered suggestions. They could get a hold of us. Okay. So we really tried to work with them in terms of what we needed for a minimum. Yeah. All right. So in the challenges, at, how about at Columbia Gorge? <laughs> well, as I said, the change is an ongoing process. Um, I'm hoping we're down to just fine-tuning language. Um, there, I still have some, to be honest, I'll be honest, I have some full-timers who say, why, I don't, my old way you always worked before, why do I have to do this? Okay, but it's much simpler to say, yeah, but look at how, look at these standards. These are much more workable, much more, um, you can adapt them much more easily. We'll work with you, nothing is necessary, only one way to do it. There's more than one way to do an RSI. And so we try to help them and give them options and things like that. Um, and still just trying to get everybody to do it, especially this year. Normally we would go do a course review through winter in the spring term. This year with everything online, we just didn't get, we just didn't do it because we're now we're either doing it online, hybrid remote or face-to-face -face remote. Okay, secret, it's asynchronous, synchronous, however you want to look at it. And so this year we didn't. And so, uh, but I'm hoping we'll reach some kind of stability, even if it stays mostly remote this next year, we will once again go back and look at those. So this, I have to admit, the pandemic and all that came with it has created some unique challenges we didn't anticipate. Yeah, we are in that exact same boat. Uh, we had not only the pandemic to rise to that occasion, but we're also migrating to Canvas right now. And so um, for us, our course reviews are on hold this year as well until we get situated over to Canvas. Um, I will say in addition to that, the other challenge that we found, we, we started with the MyCR tool very early in its development. And uh, the functionality has improved considerably over the years. But in the beginning, we were, wanted to, we were pushing it harder than it wanted to go. Um, in particular, when we decided to pull apart the facilitation review with the course design review, um, my wish list became too much for the QM system to handle. And so I, I, I'll just tell this as a warning story. Um, and so we decided to build our own course review management system. We call it the COI system. We have our own little name for it now. Um, and we have a, um, our LMS administrator actually built it. And it did, it, it did things very similar to how the QM system, the MyCR system does. The only real difference, and this was important to me, um, we can run the facilitation review and the course design review asynchronously. And so we can pick those off in pieces or in stages um, because that was the other thing we were finding either one or the other of the review team would, would slow the other one down or for some reason something would happen. And so I wanted the, the ability really to, to be able to run those asynchronously and close one or the other off and keep the other one open. And so our system allows us to do that. But I mentioned this is a warning story and I will tell you why. Um, so after, um, as you can imagine, a lot of work went into building the system originally. I asked our, um, my colleague and he said it was about 40 hours. And so that was a lot of work. And then of course we had to pilot it and work out the quirks. Um, and so that took a little time. And, and then he had to pull apart the pieces and make it even better for me. And, and we just had it perfect. 
and we heard from our ID department that that server needed to be expired. So it needs to be moved now. So, you know, it's the, it's the old story that most of us know for instructional technologists, you know, don't think hard before you build your own system because then you get in the business of maintaining that. And if you are fortunate enough to have a subscription to Quality Matters, why not use their resources? And um, in hindsight, I wish we'd stuck with the MyQ MyCR tool and um, allowed it to grow and maybe we could have figured out a way to make that work with the two different types of reviews that we had going on. But really, it's such a wonderful system and they maintain it and you've got the security there. And so in hindsight, we realized, ah, maybe we should have done that. But it was, it was a good process for us. Um, so really, this I say is the, is the bulk of our presentation. We had hoped to um, demonstrate for you a little bit in the, the MyCR tool, um, but like I mentioned, my internet bandwidth is absolutely horrible. I'm in the middle of these fires here in Oregon and everything's wacky. So I don't think we'll go out and do a live internet demonstration. The other thing that I think we would have liked to have done, but it'll be hard to do in a webinar style, is I'd be interested to hear uh, where the folks are at in terms of their custom reviews. And if you're running official QM reviews or if you are running informal reviews and to what degree you've customized them. If you'd like to respond in the chat, I'm sure our hosts will help us out with that. Yeah, if you'd like to share, just tap in the chat and we'll keep an eye on it. And um, Zip and Beth, we do have a list of questions for you. Um, as our attendees are typing in what they're going to share, do you want to take the questions now or do you want to wait? We can take them now, right? Oh, fine, yes. Sounds good. GZ, do you want to call out some questions? Uh, sure thing. Um, where do you find that most of the faculty get hung up with um, the quality matters or the MyCR portion of, of quality matters? Well, uh, speaking for myself, I mean, there's two different aspects of it, really. I mean, I'm not sure if you're referring to the technical logistical aspects or if it's regarding the standards and how to apply them to their course um, and getting behind the, the gist of the standard. I would say if it's the technical part or the process, the logistical part, um, from my perspective as a QMC, it was often um, getting the individuals to move forward with their next part of the process. So in this one in particular, so when the faculty developer, who is, now, what do they call that, course representative, AKA faculty developer, um, submits a course review application, they're then notified that they should submit the instructor worksheet. I think it's still called that, the instructor worksheet or the course worksheet. And I often found that, that there was a pause there and faculty developers really didn't understand that they had to go into the MyQM system. There was an online worksheet that they needed to complete and that that was really important to convey that information to their, their peer reviewers. The peer reviewers needed to know that information so they'd have an understanding of how the course was designed and worked. And so I often noticed it got gummed up there and I'd have to send emails or go find folks and say, look, you need to do this. It's, this is for real, you need to do it. Um, so I modified the language to be a little bit more assertive and clear. Um, not quite, hey, you do this, but it was, it, it was clearer for sure and more directive. Um, there was that, the other part of the process that was always a little bit confusing for folks um, was when the review team had finished their initial review and they'd submitted their draft report and their draft findings, then what does the review team do next? How does, in, in fact, I had someone once accuse me at, of Chemeketa stacking the decks, um, but the question is, do, does the review team meet to discuss their discrepancies and their, their similarities and how to move forward with the final report? 
or what happens? What happens then? And so there was always a little bit of confusion, even for, with the good master reviewers, I'd often get a question, what do you want me to do next? And so we have, again, clarified our communication to be very cl clear. The next thing is your review team, not including the faculty developer, should meet or have email communication about your initial results. And the master reviewer should guide the team around how to move forward. If there's not consensus, you need to have a discussion around this. If there is consensus, wonderful, great. Um, but you need to have some guidance from your team chair about how to move forward with the final report that goes out to the faculty developer. So that was always very confusing. So I clarified that. And I, I often found intimidation. Here we are, where I'm building a new framework. This is the shell I've always done, getting ready. And now we're giving them something, an initial intimidation looking at what we expect. And uh, to be honest, I think one of the biggest questions we say for all consistently was, well, if I have a discussion forum at the first week, why do I have to, why can't they just apply, why can't they, we just use that for the whole year? So it's like, well, but there's no guarantee that you're doing it weekly. What is regular? You know, re what is regular repeat? And then the term substantive. Yeah, great job. It's not a substantive reply. We were looking for the instructor, you know, putting a little bit of themselves into the responses to the students. Okay, you're the you're the uh, the topic expert. Show some of that topic expertise when you reply to a student. So those were the I think the things that kept coming up the most often from faculty. Cool. Um, I have kind of a follow up question for that, um, which um, Beth led into and um, Zip touched on as well. Um, what have you done to support training or orienting people new to using the MyCR system? And for specifically, um, do you provide definitions or examples for things like terms like substantive? I had hopes. Uh, one, we lost some of our faculty in service with the pandemic. And then that's why we're going to do an online one in another two weeks. And I had hoped that we could really clarify and, and deal with faculty questions and concerns at that. But we lost our distance learning coordinator. And right now things are kind of just kind of sitting there with a number of new administrative staff. But I'm hoping sometime in a near faculty in service, that can be one of the topics that we deal with. You know, I, it's an excellent question and it's one we're trying to deal with, but we'd like to deal with all the faculty at once. And try to, you know, we're not, we still deal with them individually as they ask, but I think there's a lot of faculty out there who aren't asking questions they have. So my, so my fingers are crossed that's gonna happen in the near future. And for our part, at least in terms of orienting them to the system and the MyCR tools and functionality, um, we started, we were lucky that we had a big pool of Quality Matters certified peer reviewers. And so they were already quite familiar with the system and how the process worked. And so the first two years that we did these informal reviews using MyCR, we used those reviewers. Um, and so I found I had to do very little um, instructing or help and my emails were, were pretty good. The very, very first group, we got together in a room and we looked at it together. So, but we didn't have to do that after that. And then um, what we did in subsequent years is if you had had a review, so you experienced it from the faculty developer side, then you were ready to become a peer reviewer. So we were kind of building on that idea of baby steps, getting familiar with the system. Um, so here's a follow up, kind of a follow up one, but um, it's with all the work that's involved and all the shifts that are involved, <clears throat> there's a huge amount of labor. People look at it and they think, oh my goodness, um, what, what's hitting me here? So what are some quick, easy, and highly impactful modifications that people can make um, in, in terms of if you're going to make some modifications where do you think faculty get the most bang for the buck? I know our team, which are all master reviewers, we always try to be positive in our responses. 
and our email is even response is positive. Um, one of my goals, and I'm hoping it can be happen be done this year, even if I'm the one to do it, I would like to build and have available for all faculty um, in a slight hierarchy, some templates with some of the things we're looking for already there. Okay, hey, there's this template, which is the basic, just does meet the standard, you know, our internal standards. There's this one, which might be a little bit, uh, be a little creative, maybe even one that's, you know, getting closer to the formal QM, but I hope to have some templates available that they can take and transfer maybe some of their courses into, or as they build new courses, build them on those templates so that as they're doing the build, they're actually already, you know, just because they have to meet the templates needs, they are meeting the requirements that we have. To me, that would make life would make life a lot easier because they see it right there. Oh, that's how that's supposed to look. That's how you want it. So that's the, that's my goal for our team this year. Yeah, um, and I would say probably the most meaningful part that I've heard from faculty developers. Well, there's two parts that I get a lot of feedback on. One is the period when they're preparing for a review, when they work with, if you have an instructional design team, when they work with that team, or when they're using the self-review tool to go through the, the standards and read the annotations and really look at their course um, with an eye towards the standards. And the, a lot of work is done during that phase to improve the course. So if you are just looking to get a better course and have the faculty understand what's involved in making a, um, a quality course, that phase in and of itself is really valuable. Um, so, so again, just recap it, it's when they, you know, know they're going to take the review. So they look at that rubric and all of the standards with an eye to how does this apply to my individual course? And they either use the self review tool or they meet with an instructional designer and they kind of talk through it and see where they're at. That's, that's huge. The other valuable thing I've heard is the time when they're, they're getting the feedback from the peer reviewers. And the feedback from their colleagues is really valuable, particularly I've heard from those within their own discipline. Hearing how others within their own discipline approach the same content and teach the same um, content is really valuable. So often, um, you know, if you can figure out another way and a simpler way for that peer mentoring and peer review experience, that is a really valuable piece to faculty and does a lot of good. So, you know, if I was trying to simplify things and I just wanted a way to impact the course quality, but I didn't have a lot of time to manage it myself. I didn't want to get into tools and systems and all that. I think I'd look for a peer mentoring or peer review opportunity that really focused on that self-review process and peer feedback. Excellent, thank you. Um, in terms of managing some of the logistics, um, frankly, I can't imagine trying to do this, losing your distance coordinator or your online learning coordinator, that would be, <clears throat> that, that would be a challenge. It is. Do you have a, a schedule in terms of revisiting the rubric? Is there a longitudinal vision that you've indicated at each of your institutions or is it a, let's do this and see how it works and then next year we'll come back and decide whether we want to do this every three years? Um, how, how is the future planning? I'm going to push that sometime during our in-service week, the week before the term starts, that the team has them, that the team meets and we discuss the very question you asked, okay? And I'm going to ask that our new VP and new dean attend so they can be supportive of our recommendations when we meet. So yeah, you ask, you ask an excellent question and without our distance learning coordinator, you know, we're gonna have to be self-driven for a while. Yeah, and we set up uh, informally, I mean, it wasn't written in stone, but we um, pulled back together that steering committee about every three years to relook at it. We're, we've gotten a little off track um, with everything else that's going on, you know, and new leadership as well at our institution. Um, but once things calm down in the spring, our, our department has talked internally that we'd like to get back on schedule with that. In the meantime, though, I will say, I probably shouldn't admit this, but 
um, my my team internally, we've now uh, done so many of these that when we see little problems with the language, little quirks that need to be changed, if it's not substantive, speaking of substantive, if it's, it's not substantive, we do tweak it ourselves and we don't even get buy-in. Um, we've discovered some things like that. And that is the beauty of that custom rubric tool. You can do that. So just to, just to make it clear. Um, in terms of, um, I'm not sure how each of your institutions is constructed. Um, I am a little bit more familiar with Chemeketa's, but it seems that every university has a different approach to online learning, um, teaching online learning, does, course design, instructional design, et cetera. And so, um, how fluent do your instructional designers have to be in quality matters, um, either when you're hiring them or do you, do you expect that or do you help train them so that they can work with faculty? Because it would seem that having a clear connection between instructional design and QM would be really advantageous, but what, what kind of intersection is there? Excellent. Uh, speaking strictly for Columbia Gorge, um, I have some instructors who do a wonderful job on their own. They're creative. They've been working with QM and Moodle long enough that they, you know, it's, it's an attractive site and things work well. But I have to admit, without our, we no longer have our designer. So um, I don't have an answer for that beyond <laughs> what we can do ourselves at this time. And for Chemeketa's part, um, we're kind of lucky. Um, back in 2009, we launched another, this is like our fifth or sixth quality assurance uh, initiative. But that one was called, well, EQ was the acronym. I can't remember what it stood for. And during that initiative, we made it required that all online faculty complete the quality matters um, IYOC or BYOC, which is improving your online course or building your online course. They had to take one of those two trainings within their first year of teaching online. And what that does is that gives everyone a solid base understanding of the QM standards. And so um, we're lucky that all of our teaching faculty have that experience. In terms of the instructional designers, uh, we're a team of um, seven and at least four of us have done a lot of QM training. So we feel like we know the QM rubric a little bit too well, maybe sometimes, but we know it well. And then the other folks, the newer folks um, have not taken the official QM training, but they are familiar with the standards, particularly in the context of accessibility, for example, for our accessibility advocate or media for our media specialist. Excellent. Um, Given that community colleges um, and a lot of other four years and eight years as well are so heavily reliant on uh, part-time faculty, non-tenure track, adjuncts, um, however we want to label them, um, how did you manage to get buy-in um, from, from these folks who were teaching online? Or was it simply, uh, if you want to teach, you need to do this? Um, I'm just curious about the uh, carrot stick um, balance there. The newer the adjunct, the easier it is. Oh, this is what <laughs> we expect. Well, here's, the, here's, the, here's our basic expectations, okay? And, and again, I hope the templates will help when those are built. Uh, it's really the, the heel digging and the issues came up with full-time adjuncts who've been doing the same thing for so long, they still didn't see a reason for change because they always perceived that their classes were successful. They didn't necessarily see that there are ways to make it even more successful, more student friendly, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but, but those are issues we have to, we will continue dealing with. And for our part, yes, I would agree with that for sure. Uh, <laughs> the newer the faculty, the easier it is. And now, of course, we've put into place some of these requirements. So, um, for example, in 2010, we adopted the requirement that faculty must take a QM training within their first year. And then later, I believe it was 2016, we adopted the requirement that all faculty, online faculty must have one online course reviewed. 
Um, so we have some of those requirements now, but in the beginning, we did a very grassroots approach. So um, in 2006, Quality Matters staff came out to Chemeketa and trained a huge group of like 60 faculty and administrators in Quality Matters. And there were lots of discussions about whether we should move forward with a pilot. And so then in early 2007, uh, QM came back out to Salem and did more training and launched a big pilot. And we had 40 faculty participate in that pilot. Um, and we did two rounds. And then the next year we did another 30 um, QM course reviews and that was voluntary, but we had, a, we had enough takers that we did 30 reviews, which was a lot, it was too much actually. And um, so we, we started all voluntary basis and grew awareness, grew support, just kind of presented it as here's what's happening out there in the online world in terms of quality, you know. If you want to know that you're teaching a quality online course, this is what it looks like. So you're welcome to ignore it if you'd like, but. <laughs> And I think I have one final question. This this kind of gets into some some potential interesting politics, but um, <laughs> in terms of uh, reviewing facilitation. So it's a two part question. And so if you'd like me to repeat it, um, I will. So let me. I'll read the question twice, just in case. Um, one, when you say reviewing facilitation, what are you reviewing exactly? And two. Did faculty share with you why they don't want their peers uh, review facilitation? So again, when you say re reviewing facilitation, what are you reviewing exactly? And did faculty share with you why they don't want their peers review facilitation? Yeah. Good question. Um, one, I don't think we were, even though we are peers, I don't think from the get-go we were introduced as peers. We were introduced as the Distance Learning Committee and QM Master Reviewers. And many of us have done it, been doing it for quite a while. So we were introduced as that rather than, oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm your peer in social sciences, or I'm your peer in this or that, okay? And so since it was the same small team, what is it, I think there's seven or eight of us who are doing the reviews, there was a lot of consistency and it just, just acceptance. We were either the bad guy or the good guy, but we were the same guys. Okay, so for us, that, that's, that's just been the way it's been. Yeah, and for us, um, uh, you know, in particular, and, you, and you're right, it did get a little political there, but particularly um, faculty within the same program did not care to have their peers looking at examples of facilitation with students. Um, and so we just respected that. Not everybody felt that way, but enough did that we, we were able to accommodate that need. Um, and frankly, we did not mind because as Tech Hub faculty, see, I have administrative access to everybody's course. And so it's quite easy for me. We also don't have to mess around with them providing samples of facilitation. I can say which former course do you want me to look at? The most recent term you taught it? Yes. I can pop in there and I can see everything. And so um, technically it was much easier to do that as well. And because we, the instructional designers I mean, work so closely with faculty on their courses, there's a, a level of trust built up there. And frankly, they all know we can do it if we want to anyway. Um, so they felt comfortable having us do that. In terms of what we look at, um, the facilitation standards are written in a generic way, but it does, to ensure that they're met, we do have to look at things like discussion board behavior. Um, we can't see email, of course, but we look at announcements discussion boards, are faculty engaged? Are they regularly participating? We look at grading feedback. Is it substantive or is it just they're, they're providing a score? You know, we want that feedback there, at least sometimes, you know, there's a threshold. So I hope that answered the question. The, wow. I'm sorry, um, did Weiwei or Emily, did you have any final questions? <laughs> Emily, I'll let you go first. Do you have any? If not, I have... No, um, Greg captured mine. Awesome. So 
um, I can't remember who it was. Either Sip or Beth, you mentioned the task force members. So who are the task force members? I'm assuming there are faculty members in there and maybe instructional designers. That's correct, and also administrators. So we had some deans participating. Um, uh, faculty, the majority of the faculty had been involved in Quality Matters, but we did have some that had not been involved in Quality Matters, just for that perspective. And, um, and instructional designers, you know, members from my department. Okay. And we, we had an instructor who became dean, but stayed with us, and the rest were all adjunct or full-time faculty. And then we had our um, distance learning coordinator. And so she, she did a lot of the typing work and the Mike CR work and stuff like that. But it was, the, it was all faculty, the sort team of faculty, who did the um, evaluations. Great. Super helpful. So did the QM adoption uh, went through a faculty senate or just wondering what the process was like? We don't have a faculty senate at Columbia Gorge, but we do have an um, instructional uh, council, which is the department chairs of all departments. And so they represent every department. They're all instructors. And so that's who we run it by, who gave us input. Although our survey did go to all faculty, but still in terms of decisions and clarifications, we used the IC. Got it. And for us, um, the first time we, we started up with Quality Matters, it was an informal adoption and we just built consensus in a grassroots way. Um, the second time in 2010, our leadership really adopted it and made it a policy, but we had done a lot of um, grassroots building, you know, building support among faculty. And then the third time when we incorporated the full as well as had those two different groups of faculty and our Senate had adopted them. Thank you, super helpful. Um, just one final question. Zip, I think it was you mentioned um, if a course did not pass the review, that just means this course cannot be taught online. Do you have a revision process built in that? I'm assuming it's not, not teaching forever, but. Right, right. Well, I mean, I see what you're saying. When we did, the, when the team does their review, again, focus primarily on RSI issues, but still when we do our review, they, they get an email from us pointing out the issues, letting them know, here's the positive you saw, here's a couple issues we think still need to be addressed. Please let us help you if we can, or if not us, here are other people you can get a hold of, like our distance learning coordinator, et cetera. And, you know, and we will be checking your course again next year. So it's not an automatic. And then, uh, of course, if you passed, you did great. It'll be two years before we look at your course again. Um, at the same time, there are, we have some faculty who just repeatedly say, well, no, this is the way I do it. And it doesn't necessarily meet the standards. And so it comes to a point where they're told, you, then you cannot teach it online. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Beth, do you have anything to share? That's pretty much how we handle it. Okay, good. Um, I'd say our approach is the same, yeah. Thank you. So I am watching the clock. We're approaching the hour. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, this is super helpful, especially as we move a large number of courses online in, in such a short period of time. Um, so we are going to close the webinar now, but if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out. And thanks everyone for attending, and we look forward to seeing you in our future sessions.